Last week, we started a, a family series, as my wife shared, and it's called Arrows. And so we're going to be doing part two of that. But what we're doing is we're learning to live towards the target. We're learning to live towards the target. And we're trying to instill simple, practical principles and disciplines to help us live a more disciplined life for God and for God's people. Amen? And it's important for us to have systems and disciplines. Otherwise, all we have are good intentions. And how many people understand that that road doesn't lead to anywhere? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That road doesn't go very, very far. And so we need systems. We need disciplines in our lives. And that's what we're trying to do. And we began the series by, by saying that we're going to use the, the word arrows. And each letter is going to, it's going to uh, be for a different word. And our first letter was a, which stood for aim. And so what is it that we're aiming towards and how do we find success? And last week we talked about um, Psalms chapter 127, excuse me. And uh, it's written by Solomon, who's, who's David's son. And what he said is he said that our homes are an archery range. Yeah. Okay, so your home is not just a home. Your home is an archery range. And every parent and grandparent and spiritual parent, you are warriors. You're getting ready to launch some arrows. And the arrows are the children in our homes. They're the children in our church. They're the, they're the children that are out there. And, and the Bible says this, he who wins souls is wise. And so the target is we want to lead our families to Christ. We want to see them all reach eternity. We, we want to see them all fulfill the plans and the purposes and the calls of God that are on their lives. And so we said, bullseye, we want to hit the bullseye. And we also said that this awesome guy named Joshua, he had this fantastic statement for his house. He said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And how do we do that? Well, we seek first the kingdom. And all of his ways, his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto us. So as we focus in on the persons of Jesus, of the Father, of the Holy Spirit, everything begins to line and we can start to shoot and hit the target, the bullseye. And so every single person in here has an as for me in my house declaration. Now, hopefully, it's as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But sometimes, it's not we will serve the Lord. We put other priorities in front of that. And we want to make sure that as followers of Jesus Christ, that we're not putting other things in front of serving the Lord. Okay? So make sure God is the primary. He is the focus. He's the target of who we are. Now, the second letter is R. And this stands for release. To release means to let it fly. How many people like to let it fly? Come on, say let it fly. Let it fly. Okay, come on. Nobody likes to let it fly. Nobody? Nobody likes to just see what happens when you let it fly. Nobody? Okay, Peter and I, Peter and I, we're together, Peter. You and I, we will let things fly. And whatever happens, I'm good. Letting go is the name of the game when it comes to parenting. And I think this is one of the most difficult things for, for uh, parents and for people. Why? Because we've learned a different way of parenting, maybe because of the culture that we grew up in or, 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 or what we taught. But we're actually called to let them fly. You see, the release is the most essential part to archery. You can have the nicest arrows. You can have the nicest bow and the nicest quiver. You can even have little elf uh, shoes and hats with a big feather if you want to. But none of that is going to matter if you don't pull that string back and let it fly. Come on, say let it fly. You like it. Come on, let it fly. Let it fly. Okay, uh, on Wikipedia, there are 12 steps to letting it fly, okay? And so I just want to talk about step number nine. You got to hear step number nine. It's pretty cool. It says, release the arrow by relaxing the finger of your string hand. 
While this may sound simple, the manner in which you release your fingers from the bowstring can impact the arrow's flight. The aim is to get as clean of a release as possible, and this will probably take time. Problems that you may encounter when releasing the bow include flinching, wobbling, <laughs> anticipating the shot inaccurately. Okay, so actually thinking that you're going to miss the mark. Anything that deflects the string from the way you remove your fingers can alter the arrow's course. As clean of a release as possible, okay? That's what it's talking about. It takes your fingers, your hands, to be relaxed as you shoot that arrow. And again, this is very difficult for a lot of people because a lot of people are running their homes like a prison center rather than a launching pad. Okay, so I want us to look at our families as a launching pad, like a space center, you know, where you're going to launch an arrow out into outer space. That's the goal, is to release our children into all the purposes and promises and, and let them go for God, right? I don't want to hold my kids. Can you imagine holding somebody and saying, okay, go, and they're running and they're not going very far? No, I want to release them. And so we need to think of our, our homes as that, not solitary confinement. We're not, we're not trying to keep people in and keep people out and all of that kind of good stuff. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6, Proverbs 22, 6. And I'm just going to show you why. I, I'm coming to this place. It's a very biblical place to come from. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Tell me when you're there, say amen. amen. Okay, it says, train up. A child in the way that he should, in the way that he should, in the way that he should, and even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Therefore, our job is to get the children ready to, to go. That's right. Again, prison structures, they, they keep people, right? Ned Flanders off the Simpson, Oakley Doakley neighbor. He would never even tell that there was a sin to his kids. Everything was always perfect and fine. <laughs> All right. So point number one, you might ask this question. What, what is the way in which our children should go? Right? And in that scripture that we just read, we're talking about really discovering the grain in a piece of wood finding the knots and how they can all be worked into um, a project, if you will, because arrows are all different, right? We said this last, last week that all of these arrows, all of these children, all of these people, they have different personalities. Hello? How many people know that? <laughs> And our children have different personalities from your children and, and so forth. And, and so we really have to pay attention here to where they're at so that we can, we can ask heaven for the right things to do. Okay. So we ask the question, what is the way in which they should uniquely go? Well, for that, we have to ask mission control. Right? Because we're this launching pad. We gotta, we gotta talk to mission control. So turn in with me in your Bibles to Judges chapter 13. Judges chapter 13 and verse 12. And just to give you a quick background of what's happening here, uh, God tells Samson's dad and mom that you guys, you're gonna have a baby boy one day. He's gonna be super strong. And he's going to be a deliverer, and he's going to help overthrow the Philistines, and, and all of this kind of stuff, Judges 13 and 12. And, and, and this is the thing, Samson's dad is so smart and so quick. Like, this guy was a quick thinker, okay? He was smart. This is what it says in verse 12. And Manoah, which is Samson's dad, said, now when your words come true, I love that, when your words come true, Okay, when God speaks something, you could take that to the bank. It's going to happen. And he says, when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life and what is his mission? Wow. Child's not even born yet. Samson's dad's like, whoa, God, tell me, how do I prepare my son 
to release him to fulfill the mission and the calling that you've called him to. Right from the very beginning, even before the very beginning happened, he's commissioning God, asking God on behalf of his child how he can equip him for the services that God has called him to. That's awesome. That's, that's what we ought to do. That's, that's mission control right there. <laughs> this is what it says in Psalms 144. It says, may our sons in their youth be like Plants full grown are daughters like corner pillars. Corner pillars hold weight. Cut from the structure of the palace to get them ready to hit the target. I love hitting the target. I love letting it fly. Here's number two. Keep in mind the beginning from the end. Keep in mind the end from the beginning. You see, when we're thinking about launching a ship, when do we think about launching it? Is it at the countdown? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, blast off! No, it's when we're thinking about the ship. We're thinking about making this spaceship. We're thinking about how it's going to fly. We're thinking about shooting this thing into outer space with such a force that nobody can contain it. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So don't interfere with the arrow on the way out. You see, we're called to think about these things from an early stage. It's, it's not like, oh, I'll, I'll instill something in my children when they reach grade nine. Or when they go to college or university. Or on their wedding day. Maybe on their wedding day I'll instill it into them. No. No. That's not when we instill it into our children. We instill it into them. When we hear that our children, we hear that our our wives are are pregnant, it's time to start laying hands on the womb and start to pray and ask God from heaven, how on earth, God, do you want me to prepare this baby to fulfill the plans and the callings and the purposes that you have for this baby? I mean, that was a good place to say amen. I'm just... I'm just throwing it out there. You know, Hannah, Hannah, God told Hannah this. He said <coughs> that the dream of your heart was going to come to pass. You see, Hannah, she was barren. She couldn't have children. So she was crying out. You don't believe me? Okay, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1. Some of you guys, you know, you're not believing me. So turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1. We'll, we'll, we'll look at verses 10 and 11. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. By the way, 1 and 2 Samuel, my two favorite books of the Bible, just so you know, just a little trivia, in case it ever comes up on the screen someday. Okay, 1 Samuel 1, verse 10. It says this, Hannah was in deep anguish. Now that doesn't sound like she's having a good day or a good several years, does it? Crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord and she made this vow, O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow, answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will not be cut. You know what Hannah was saying? If you give me a child, I will release him to you. I will let it fly. And so God opens up her womb and allows her to have a baby boy and his name is Samuel. Samuel. What is Samuel? Well, Samuel was a prophet. If you read, it'll actually tell you in 1 Samuel that the word of God was rare in those days. It's not like today. The Holy Spirit was not poured out. Today, the Holy Spirit's poured out. He speaks to all of us. Back then, he used specific vessels to communicate to people. He was a mediator between God and between man. He anointed the first king. Uh, Saul, he anointed the second king. David, he was a mighty man of God because he had a praying mom that released the arrow to God. (laughs) Let's look at verse 27 and 28 of that same, same chapter. It says, I asked the Lord to give me this boy, and he has granted my request. Now I am giving him to the Lord, and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. 
and they worshipped the Lord there. Do you know what Hannah did to her son? She brought him to the Lord. Do you know what we're supposed to do? Bring our children to the Lord. She brought him to the Lord, church. She laid him at God's feet and said, I give him to you. Even before she could have a baby, she let her fingers go of that, of that string so that that, that that arrow could hit the target. This is one of the reasons why we do baby dedication. Okay, because what we're saying is, God, my child is not my child. My child is your child. And I'm releasing my child to you. I will do the best I can to help my child in the ways of the Lord. I will do the best I can to raise them properly, to send them out to hit the mark for you. And so I'm dedicating them to you. I, I, I'm just giving this child to you. And this is the difference between the thought that we are stewards versus owners. Now I'm going to tell you what the difference between a steward and an owner is. A steward has been tasked with the, uh, 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 the responsibility of an assignment. An owner says, this is mine, and has this, this thing tight-fisted instead of open. You and I don't own anything. And the quicker we understand this lesson, the further we're going to go in God. Nothing that you have, you own. You know how I know that? Because you're going to leave here the same way you came in, with nothing. When you came in, you were naked and screaming. Some of you may leave that way. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't help myself. I'm sorry. I was trying to keep it. It's hard sometimes. Okay. <clears throat> if you say, Pastor Philip, I'm going away on a trip and I'd like you to come look after my house. First of all, you don't know me very well. I am the most irresponsible person on the planet, okay, when it comes to these things. So you're making a big mistake by, no, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> if you say, can you come and look after my house? And I say, okay, sure. And you leave a list of things for me to do, right? Feed the cat, water the plants. Those might not be alive when you come home, just so you know. Um, you know, I need you to clean the, I don't know, the laundry room. Whatever it is, you, you leave me with a, a, a group of tasks. I come into your house recognizing that I am not the owner of your house. I am in proxy of the owner of the home. I come in. And I take these tasks and these responsibilities as if the owner was doing them even though they're not mine. We are stewards of everything that, everything that we have. Okay? <laughs> everything. It's even our time. We're a steward of our time. We're a steward of our, of our money, our resources. We're a steward of, of every gift that's given. Whatever you're really good at, you you. You use these skills, you know, to make a living. Whatever it is, you are a steward. You have been given these skills by Almighty God. Thank you so much for that, amen. That was a great place. Everything comes from every good and perfect gift comes from Him. We're just stewards of, of, of what we have. And so here's the deal. When every steward, with every stewardship, there is a time of reckoning. There is a time of accountability to give an account for what we've done with the things that we've been given. There will come a time where we stand before the Ancient of Days and we give an account for the things that we've done with the things that we've been given. Okay? And I, I understand that that's not comfortable, but that's why we need to really think about what we're doing and how our time is short and we want to burn the brightest for God. We want to make the deepest impact that we possibly can for him. And you may say, oh, I'm going to do this over here in private. I'm telling you what, God has nanny cams set up everywhere. You think you can get away with it? Nanny cam. Nobody's going to know. Nanny cam. Everywhere. It's tapped. It's rigged. Nanny cam. Okay? Number three. 
Children are supposed to leave, but the marriage is supposed to stay. Okay, this is, this is what it says. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, it says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall both become one flesh. A child is supposed to leave. If your child is 29 years of age or older living at your house, it's time for them to what? You said it, not me. <laughs> totally set you up for that. It was everybody else. I never said that. Come out at me. Everybody else said that. Okay. <laughs> our relationship doesn't end with our children. But what happens is now they move out and they establish their own home, right? A husband is joined to his, to his wife. Um, but the husband and the wife's relationship it should never be changing. It's not supposed to end, right? Okay, I'm just going to tell you, it's true. It should not end. It's not supposed to. And uh, this is why it's very important that a husband and wife date regularly. Man, I thought I was going to get an amen for that one too. <laughs> Women, you are letting me down here. I came for you and you left me hanging with my hand in the air for a high five. My goodness. <laughs> you know what? I, I'm going to tell you what irritates me. It irritates me when somebody says, I don't have time to take my wife out or my husband out on a date. But they have time to take their kids all over the place. You know, music lessons, sports, entertainment, all this kind of stuff. And they don't have time to spend with their spouse or God. That just... I, I'll just leave it there. I'll just tell you that's an irritant for me. We need to do the most with our time. We need to make sure that we are with our spouse. We are dating our spouse. We are making sure that that marriage is strong long after our children leave. And we see a lot of marriages in the world crumble at empty nest syndrome. And there's parents saying, I'm just going to hold on till my kids you know, are old enough and then I'm out of here. Well, why? There's a number of reasons, but there's a large, large part of the reason is because children have taken a place of influence, of prominence, and, and priority. They have taken a place of influence, prominence, and priority. They have as much say as the spouse has, okay? And it's not supposed to be that way. It was never intended that way. We shouldn't be siding with our children and not our spouse, our partners who we do life with, we, we are on the same team raising these children the way that we decided that God told us to raise them. And so we are a united front at home. You could try to play me or my wife. It's not going to work. It's not going to happen. I side with her. You always side with mom. You're right. I do. The quicker you learn that, the better it is going to be for you in life. She's my wife. Okay? She has more of a say than you have in this house, just to break it to you. I know this is revelation for a lot of people. <laughs> Woo! Okay. <laughs> See, the problem is, is dad and mom are no longer husband and wife because they're too busy being dad and mom. Sunday night, I tell everybody, this is my time with my wife. I tell my children, look, this is my time with my wife. Okay, unless you're dying, you better not enter into my time with my wife. This is for my wife. It's for her only, not for you. And, and I'm very serious about that. Uh, but children are not meant to be the focal point of the home. That's, that's not at all the reality. They're not the centerpiece. The focal point of the home is always Jesus, always. Okay, he's our number one. Our spouse is our number two. Then our children can fall in after that. And sometimes you could say, Jesus is my number one. My spouse is my number two. Then we have a dog. We have a fish. We... And then at the bottom is... <laughs> okay. All right. I'll stop. I'll stop. Uh, you know, I've heard parents say, my baby is my universe. I hope you don't mean that. I understand what you're saying, but I hope that's not the reality. Because what happens is they take precedent over your spouse. And that's not what God intended for the family at all. At all. It's God intended us to have an incredible marriage. 
And out of that concept is how we should parent our children. Is out of a relationship with God, a relationship with our number two, and then our number three. So, you know what an empty nest should become? A love nest. The kids are gone. Hallelujah. It's time. Come on, church. I could draw pictures, but I won't. Number four, (laughs) too much clutch is no better than too much gas. We've all seen parents give their children too many things, and then they go buck, you know, they just, anyways, they go, they go all over the place. They're unrestricted, unfiltered, unmonitored. Um, all the internet access they want, they can have it in their rooms, they can close their doors. And um, we're going to talk about later in the series how no discipline equals no love. Because the Bible says, he who does not discipline his children hates his children. That's actually what the Word says. And so we're going to talk about that. And then there's, <clears throat> there's the equal that's opposite of too much clutch. You know, a parent that is hyper strict, right? They're legalistic. You can't do anything. You do what I tell you to do, and that's it. You can't celebrate Christmas that's a pagan holiday. You can't do this. You can't, you can't do that. And you can't watch Veggie Tales, okay? Because Veggie Tales is not Christian enough. It's too carnal. And uh, you don't even let them know that there's a sin, right? Again, we talk about Ned Flanders, okay? And so this is zero preparation to deal with the things that are going to come at them, yeah. right? Zero preparation at all. The world is coming. And if we don't give our children any bandwidth, they're not going to know how to handle the things that are in the world. I'm just talking truth right now. That's all I'm talking. I'm just talking truth, okay? And so we need to give them a little bit of bandwidth because too much clutch is no better than too much gas. They haven't built decision-making muscles and skills yet. So we've got to help them with that. So here's a good example. A good example is a mother drops her daughter off at the movies with her friends, okay? And the mother drives away and says, oh, I'll come back and get them in a couple of hours. That should be good. And she comes back in a couple of hours and her daughter's not there anymore. And she can't find her anywhere. Well, come to find out her daughter's friends said, let's go get ice cream instead of going to the movies. Now, does that cause the devil to jump in your kids? No, okay? But the point of the matter is, The child broke protocol. They left somewhere without asking their guardian, without asking their parents. And so she calls up her daughter and her daughter goes, oh, we decided to go for ice cream. And the phone gets really quiet. I came to get you and you're gone. Something could have happened to you. And so what happens is the mom gave that child all kinds of rope to go to the movies And the child, instead of doing the right thing and calling the mom and asking if it was okay, just said, oh, she won't care. I'm going to tell you something. If you allow that to happen and you don't do anything, then other stuff is going to happen that you're going to wish didn't happen. So now you take away some of that rope. And you say, guess what? Because you didn't call me like you were supposed to, next time you go to the movies with your friends, guess who's coming? They're going to get it really quick. They're going to get it really quick. And I'm loud when I go to the movies, just so you know. I'm going to embarrass you. It's not going to be pleasant for you. Trust me. Okay, and what happens when you do stuff like that? Well, your child grows up and they say, Dad and Mom, I want to go to this party. And you say, okay, who's going to be there? Because that's important. We want to make sure there's safety. And they say, oh, da-da-da-da-da-da, okay, fine, I'll take you to the party, and they drop them off. And all of a sudden, the party starts getting out of hand, and there's drinking, and there's drugs, and there's all kinds of things going on, and the child calls dad and mom up and says, I need you to come and get me. You say, wow, it's it's pretty early, like, why? Well, they're drinking and doing drugs, and I don't want to be a part of that. I'll be right there, right there. Okay? Police siren and everything. And you know what happens? My child does that. I just say, here's the rope. Here, just have the rope. You can have it all. Have all the rope. Because now you're ready to fly. 
Now you're ready to hit the target. Now, now you've shown me something that you've learned at home. And that's important. It's really, really important. We believe in you. I'm just going to give you a couple more things. First, empower, don't hover. Children don't like helicopter parents, okay? <laughs> Always up in their grill, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Okay, we, just, we use the rope principle where we, we give some, and if they, if they can't handle that, then we take some back, right? Until they're ready to handle the rope. <laughs> can't let your children get hurt, so we're just going to put bubble wrap all around you before you go play soccer or football. And what happens is it creates a prolonged adolescence. They're, they're not able to grow because they haven't gone through some, they haven't gotten some boo-boos on their arm and they haven't gone through anything. And so they're not growing up as quickly as, as what they need to. We're fighting battles for them rather than allowing them to learn how to fight battles. We're going in and we're telling the teacher what's up instead of saying, okay, how are you going to handle this situation? Yeah. All right, I want to teach my kids some some life-changing problem skills. So our goal is not to hover. Our goal is to empower. Yes. If we take away all this, you know, all the conflict, hurts help us grow. It's who we are today because of the things we've gone through. The last thing I'm going to give you is all dreams take a back seat to God's dreams. Yes. See, it's easy for us to push our children, to follow in our footsteps. It's easy for us to have dreams. And it's not a bad thing to have dreams. But it's easy for us to want to live through our children. Yes. And we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to let it fly. Right? We're supposed to let it fly. So we need to make sure, you know, I, I want to say this. Going to a movie is not bad. Being involved in a sporting event, it's not a bad thing. Exercising, it's not a bad thing. Getting good grades, those are all good things. Okay, I, I think they're all important things, but they are not the priority. Okay? Just because we want our kids to get a 4.0 and go on to be whatever, that's not the priority of their lives, and it shouldn't be, and it shouldn't be the priority of our lives either. It should be preparing them for what God has for them, yes. for bringing them to the Lord and saying, here's the one that you need. When you go through all of these things, here's the one that you need to access. I'll do my best to, to help you out, but I'm going to tell you something. I have to lean on God too. And the sooner you learn to lean on God, the sooner you'll learn where your source, where your portion, where your strength comes from, where joy comes from, where meaning of life comes from, where every good and perfect thing comes from because all we are is stewards. We are not owners. And so everything that we have, we will give an account to God for what we've done with those things. And so it's important for us to make the most of our time. Let's stand. We're going to sing one last song. And as we sing this song, if you say, you know what, Lord, I want to get my priorities right with you. I want our family to come in line with who you are. Just take this moment in the song to say, God, I want to refocus us. I want you to change the dynamics within my home, in our home. Maybe I haven't been treating my wife right. I've been putting my kids in front of my wife instead of my wife in front of my children. I, I, I've been putting people in front of you, God. That's wrong. Forgive me, God. Well, this is a time that where we sing this song, that if any of those things are living inside of us, that we repent before the Lord and say, I'm sorry, God. I want to live my life for you. I want my children to hit the mark. I want to find out from heaven what you have for all of us. Amen. God bless you.